thanks for having me here. Thanks to everybody who's sticking here till the end of the day. I'd like to begin with a technical term, a steampunk. Steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film. One of my favorite descriptions is set in the late 19th century. It encompasses all of the romanticism of the Victorian era, and then cranks up the technological level to 11. The steampunk works feature old settings, some of the earliest factories, men in top hats, women in petticoats, together with futuristic technologies, such as time machines, robots, and flying ships. This blend of old and new creates a wonderful sense of nostalgia and adventure. Fans dress up in these steampunk costumes and gather at steampunk conven conventions. I like to say they dream it. Quantum information thermodynamicists live it. Let's break down that term. Thermodynamics is a branch of physics, chemistry, and engineering. It's the study of energy, the forms that energy can be in, and the transformations amongst those forms. Thermodynamics was developed during the 1800s, the steampunk era. It was inspired by the Industrial Revolution. For the first time, steam engines were powering factories, transforming civilization, so people wanted to know how efficiently steam engines could operate. However, these practical considerations led to fundamental questions, such as why does time flow in only one direction? Thermodynamics was developed to describe a transformative technology of the day, the steam engine, so a large classical system. Today's transformative technologies look a little different. We have great control over small systems. For instance, here's a single strand of DNA. You can use lasers to trap one end of the strand and pull the other end. You can measure the work required to stretch the strand through a given distance. Of course, technologies that are up and coming now are quantum. This is a dilution fridge that belongs to IBM in which IBM cools down one of its quantum computers. Superconducting, qubit, superconducting qubits do need to be at low temperatures in order to exhibit quantum phenomena. And cooling, expelling waste heat, is a thermodynamic process. We can also be interested in the interplay between information processing and energy processing. Also, a lot of recent experiments that have been very interesting have featured far from equilibrium systems. Equilibrium is a quiet state in which Large-scale properties, such as average energy, remain constant. You and I as living beings are far from equilibrium, but there have been interesting quantum far from equilibrium experiments recently. You can, say, take a bunch of ultra-cold atoms and kind of whack them so that they come far out of equilibrium, and then you can watch how they settle back down. All of these settings are very different from the conventional thermodynamic setting of the 1800s. However, thermodynamic concepts such as work and heat remain relevant. We need a toolkit for re-envisioning the thermodynamics of the 1800s for the 21st century. Quantum information theory forms such a toolkit. I imagine everyone here is familiar with the concept of quantum information theory, but to ensure that we're all precisely on the same page, I'll give my impression of what quantum information theory is. To me, quantum information theory is the study of how we can use quantum physics to process information in ways in which we can't if we have only classical systems. Also, quantum information theory is the understanding of quantum systems through how they store and process information. By process information, I mean solve computational problems, communicate information, secure information cryptographically, and store information in memories. By quantum phenomena, I mean a host of things. Entanglement between particles, how operators can fail to commute with each other, the discreteness of spectra, how measurements disturb quantum systems, and even more. The quantum information theory, like thermodynamics in part, has been developed because of the promise of technology in this case by quantum computers, 
But now that it's been developed, it just forms this wonderful mathematical and conceptual toolkit that's being applied to many different fields of science to gain new lenses onto them. Black hole physics, condensed matter physics, computer science, and thermodynamics. We can take the thermodynamics of the 1800s and update it for the 21st century using quantum information theory. At this intersection, there are a number of questions to be asked. For instance, the laws of thermodynamics were originally developed again in and around the 1800s for large classical systems, many of them at equilibrium. But these laws have proved remarkably robust in extending to small systems, quantum systems, far from equilibrium systems, and information processing systems. Also, we know from quantum information science that quantum phenomena can enhance information processing tasks, such as computing. Just as there are information processing tasks, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as powering systems, cooling systems, and charging batteries. Given that quantum phenomena can enhance information processing tasks, how can they enhance thermodynamic tasks? Finally, we can study quantum systems that exchange energy and other thermodynamic quantities and ask which of their thermodynamic behaviors will we never see in the classical world. We can start to understand the difference between quantum and classical through thermodynamics. So at this intersection, we get the field of quantum thermodynamics, or a quantum information theoretic strand of quantum thermodynamics. I think that it is really the essence of steampunk. So I call it quantum steampunk. Because again, steampunk, like thermodynamics, is set in Victorian settings. Uh, thermodynamics was developed during the 1800s. But it involves also futuristic and cutting edge science and technology. Here's where I'd like to go in the rest of this talk. First, I'd like to convince you that it makes some sense to use quantum information theory as our toolkit to update thermodynamics. Then I'll show that we can use both thermodynamic work and information as resources in both thermodynamics and information processing. Thermodynam quantum thermodynamics is a rich landscape with many different subfields. So depending on how much time I have, I'll introduce some of the subfields briefly in case you'd like to explore them more later. Why does it make sense to put together quantum information theory with thermodynamics? Also about this slide, when I was making this talk, basically to amuse myself, I peppered it with a bunch of steampunk art. So if steampunk is not your favorite aesthetic, I apologize, but decorating the talk kept me abused, so hopefully it'll at least keep you awake. A big question in information theory is, how efficiently can we perform information processing tasks? The answer I like to call the liver of information theory. I used to have a biology teacher who said, if you ever don't know the answer to a question on a test of mine, write down liver. The liver turns out to perform a ridiculous number of functions in the human body. If you ever don't know the answer to a biology question and you answer liver, you have an anomalously high probability of being correct. Similarly, if anyone asks you, what is the optimal efficiency with which we can perform some information processing task? And you answer a function of an entropy, you have an anomalously high probability of being correct. By an entropy, I mean a function of a quantum state or a probability distribution. It quantifies the uncertainty about the outcome of a measurement of the states or the value of a variable distributed according to this probability distribution. To progress farther, we'll need to do a quick review of density operators, since I was told that some people here might be familiar with them and some people here might not. I'll denote density operators by rho. It's, you can think of a density operator as a matrix relative to your favorite basis. 
if this density operator represents the state of a qubit, then the matrix is two by two. Technically, a density operator is a trace one positive semi-definite linear operator. Trace one means if you measure the states, you'll obtain some outcome. Positive semi-definite means if you take this matrix and calculate its eigenvalues, you'll find that they're all real and at least zero. Linear means that this operator is particularly simple. We represent density operators for qubit states with points on or in the block sphere, which you've probably seen. A particularly simple class of states consists of pure states. We can write a pure state as this outer product. This ket represents a vector in a Hilbert space. It's represented geometrically by an arrow that extends from the center of the block sphere all the way out to the surface. As you probably know, this upward pointing arrow represents the quantum analog of the zero bits. The downward pointing arrow represents the quantum analog of the one, and a qubit can be in any superposition of the two. Another class of states consists of mixed states. These cannot be expressed simply as outer products or simply as cats. If a system is in a mixed state, it is entangled with some other quantum system. A mixed state is represented geometrically by an arrow that doesn't make it all the way out to the surface of the block sphere. The shorter the arrow is, the more entangled the qubit is with some other system. A favorite example from thermodynamics is the quantum thermal state. Suppose that we have a qubit that's exchanging heat with a bath that has a fixed temperature. The qubit will likely end up in this thermal state. Beta is the inverse temperature of the bath. H is the Hamiltonian governing the system, the qubit's evolution. And Z is called the partition function. It ensures that the state is normalized to one. Now that we've reviewed a little background, we can look at an entropy close up. Let's say that an entropy is the optimal efficiency with which we can perform some information processing task. Suppose that I want to send you a message. We agree in advance about which possible messages I might send. You know, the probability that I'll send A, the probability that I'll send B, and so on. According to you, I'm sending this mixed state in which the possible letters are weighted by their probabilities. Suppose, for mathematical convenience, that I send n copies of this state. I send a tensor product. Suppose that I want to squeeze the total message into the smallest possible number of qubits. I am performing the information processing task of data compression. How many qubits do I need? The answer comes to us from Schumacher's theorem. According to it, the number of qubits I need in the limit as the number of copies approaches infinity, the number of qubits I need per copy of the message is the negative of the trace of the state times the log of the states, the von Neumann entropy. It quantifies your average uncertainty about which message I'm sending. So here's a simple example in which an entropy quantifies the optimal efficiency with which we can perform some information processing task. But why is this entropy called an entropy? We learned the answer from Claude Shannon, who founded information theory in the mid 20th century. This is a Google Doodle from Shannon's 100th birthday a few years ago. Shannon said that John von Neumann, the great Hungarian-American mathematical physicist, said, you should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used in statistical mechanics under that name, so it already has a name. In the second place, and more important, no one knows what entropy really is, so in a debate, you will always have the advantage. That's why I do information theory and thermodynamics. Indeed, here is the fundamental relation of statistical mechanics, which is a field very closely associated with thermodynamics. And here is the thermodynamic entropy. In statistical mechanics, this entropy quantifies how spread out across a space a probability distribution is. Suppose that we have a classical statistical mechanical system of many, many particles, say a gas in a box, favorite example of physicists. 
we can't uh, suppose that this box that excuse me suppose that this gas is classical so we can imagine that all of its particles have definite positions and momenta and angular momenta at any given time but there are far too many particles for us to be able to measure all of the positions and momenta and so on so we can't know which configuration which microstate the system is in Instead, we label all of the possible microstates. These possible microstates form a space that we call phase space. And we ascribe a probability density over phase space to the system. How spread out across phase space that probability density is, is a measure of our ignorance about which microstate the system is in. And how spread out across the phase space this probability density is, is measured by the entropy. So in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, as in information theory, we use entropies to quantify uncertainty. Well, hopefully I've convinced you that thermodynamics and information theory share commonalities. Now I'd like to show that they can help each other out. I'd like to show that we can use information to transform heat into work. Heat and work are the two types of energy that can be transferred between systems. Heat is the random energy of particles jiggling about. It's uncoordinated energy. It isn't directly useful to, say, push a rock up a hill. Work is coordinated. It can be directly harnessed we can see that we can use information to turn kind of useless heat into work useful work by a construction called Szilard's engine. Leo Szilard was another great Hungarian American physicist who worked during the 20th century. Suppose that once again, we have a classical gas in a box. This is going to be a really, really, really simple gas, consists of only one particle. Suppose that the gas exchanges heat through the walls of its box with a heat bath or environment at a fixed temperature T. Suppose we begin with one bit of information about the gas. We know that it's on the right-hand side of the box rather than the left-hand side. We can slide a partition into the box, then tie a rope to the partition and tie an Acme anvil to the rope, then unfix the partition so that it can slide. The particle is going to punch the partition. It's going to keep punching the partition until the partition reaches the opposite end of the box. Now we have lifted the anvil. The anvil has gained gravitational potential energy. We've performed useful work on it. Where did that energy come from? It came from the heat bath, the environment. We turn heat from the heat bath into useful work. How much work can we perform, at least on average under ideal conditions? This type of work is pressure volume work, so it equals this integral. We learned the ideal gas law in high school. Pressure times volume equals the number of particles times Boltzmann's constant, which is a universal constant of nature, times the temperature. We can solve for the pressure in terms of the volume and substitute into the integral. I'm integrating from V over two to V because the particle begins confined to half the box and ends up able to be anywhere in the entire box. We integrate, we evaluate the limits, and we find that the work performable is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times the log of two. But we can perform that much work, but at a cost. We now have no idea where in the box the particle is. We forfeited our bit of information. In other words, we traded information for work with the help of heat. We can reverse this process and call, perform what's called Landauer erasure. Rolf Landauer was an information scientist at IBM. He actually thought that quantum computing is impossible. He thought that we would never be able to control quantum systems well enough to run a large scale quantum computer. Hopefully he was wrong about that, but he had very, very good insights 
about the relationship between thermodynamics and information. Suppose that we begin with a particle that is at some unknown, totally random location in a box. We want to reset the particle's position so that the particle ends up on the right-hand side of the box, a nice, clean state. This is like taking a messy sheet of scrap paper that's been scribbled on totally randomly and erasing it to a nice, clean state. We begin with a lifted anvil the capacity to perform work. We can slide a partition into the box beside one end and push the partition to the box's center. The gas will end up trapped in the right-hand side. Since we're compressing a gas, we have to perform work. The amount of work that we need to perform is, on average, at least the amount that we could extract by a Szilard's engine. So we had to give up work, but at least we obtained information. The bit is now in a known state. This story has deep implications for the relationship between computation and thermodynamics. Suppose that we compute and compute and compute and compute. Eventually, we'll run out of scrap paper. The universe doesn't have an infinite supply of scrap paper, so we'll have to erase some. We just saw that erasure costs work. So computation has an intrinsic thermodynamic cost. So I first learned that in my first quantum computation class, senior spring of college. When I learned it, I was staggered because a priori, Information processing and thermodynamics seem like they don't have necessarily anything to do with each other, but they turn out to be very closely intertwined. I've been telling you a story about a classical gas in a box, but this talk is called quantum steampunk, so how can we bring quantum physics in? There are a number of ways in which quantum physics can alter the story. I'll talk about one way. We can use entanglement in our erasure protocol. Suppose that we want to reset not a classical bit stored by the location of a gas in a box, but a qubit. We want to erase the qubit by resetting it to the zero state. Suppose that this qubit is entangled with some memory, and again, there's a heat bath that we can draw on. We turn out to be able to erase this qubit while keeping the memory in its same reduced state while extracting net positive work. This result should surprise us. According to Landauer, we have to spend work to erase information. Here, supposedly, we can extract work. The trick is to kind of burn the correlations between the system and the memory. More specifically, imagine that we, um, the system and the memory were maximally entangled. They'd be in a Bell state. Imagine that we performed a Bell measurement on this system. A Bell measurement is a measurement that projects the state onto one of the four maximally mixed states of two qubits. So there are four possible outcomes. And since this whole system is maximally entangled, it's in a pure state. We know which one outcome we will obtain even before we perform the measurement. Since we know with certainty one of four possible outcomes, we have two bits of information. We can run, run uh, excuse me, we can run Sealard's engine twice. From each bit of information, we can extract an amount of two of, of work equal to Boltzmann's constant times temperature times log two. So on the whole, we can extract two kT log two units of work. We can then spend one of those units on erasing the system of interest. We will be left with one unit of work, which is the work we extracted. So we can think in thermodynamics of quantum information or entanglement as a kind of 
a quote unquote fuel or scare quotes fuel in the presence of heat. In summary, we can use information to turn kind of useless heat into useful work. We can use information, including entanglement and work both as resources in both information processing and thermodynamics. I mentioned quantum thermodynamics is a rich landscape. There are many different subfields. And they are, many of them are talked about in different chapters in my book. I'll take about five minutes or so, five, 10 minutes to say a few words about different subfields in, in case you'd like to check them out. I won't have time to talk about all of them. I mentioned earlier that there are thermodynamic tasks, just as there are information processing tasks. We can extract work, we can cool systems, we can charge batteries. Accordingly, there are thermal machines, such as engines, refrigerators, ratchets, and batteries. Can we define an engine cycle, not just for a, a classical gas, as we do in undergraduate statistical physics class, but also for a quantum system, such as a qubit or a quantum harmonic oscillator. We can define engine cycles and refrigeration cycles and so on for quantum systems, but we can create quantum thermal machines. Some of these quantum thermal machines can achieve certain advantages over some of their classical counterparts. An example that has received a lot of attention over the past few years is a set of quantum batteries. Suppose that you have a bunch of batteries formed from qubits. Batteries, or the qubits are defined in terms of energy eigenstates. Suppose that you start with the batteries in their ground states with no energy, and you want to charge the batteries. You're interested in the power at which you can charge the batteries. How quickly can you put in work? Or what is the best rate at which you can put in work. It turns out that you can charge batteries at a higher rate if you entangle them than if you don't entangle them. Another subfield consists of resource theories for thermodynamics. The resource theory framework is a mathematical and conceptual toolkit developed in quantum information theory. A resource theory is a simple model for any situation in which the operations we can perform and the systems we can access are constrained. For example, in a thermodynamic context, we could have a thermodynamic agent who is in a fixed temperature environment. The agent is constrained to obey the first law of thermodynamics, the energy of the entire system under consideration must be conserved. Also, the agents in this fixed temperature environment can easily access only systems at thermal equilibrium at this temperature. Resource theories were first formalized to help us understand how entanglement could transform. But this way of thinking became so useful that people started developing resource theories for lots of different contexts. Entanglements, thermodynamics, there are resource theories for coherence, for randomness, but thermodynamics very naturally fits into the resource theory framework as I just described. We can use resource theories to reason about the optimal efficiencies with which we can perform information processing tasks and see how uh, states can naturally transform under thermodynamic processes. Closely related is what's sometimes called one-shot statistical mechanics. In conventional thermodynamics, we often think about systems of many, many, many particles or averaging over many, many trials. What if we have only one particle? Uh, what if we have just 10? What if those particles are entangled? What if we're not interested in the average trial, but in the worst case trial or the best case trial? We can use tools developed a few years ago in quantum information theory, a toolkit called information theory beyond independent and identically distributed 
um, systems or one-shot information theory. We can use that mathematical toolkit to answer these questions about performing thermodynamic tasks, such as extracting work, outside of the conventional thermodynamic setting of many, many, many particles and averages. Another subfield consists of or involves fluctuation theorems. Fluctuation theorems are equalities that can describe, for example, the strand of DNA that I showed earlier. I said that we can stretch the strand of DNA and measure the work required to stretch the strand um, in any given trial. Well, a fluctuation theorem is kind of a stronger version of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics helps us understand why time flows in only one direction. There are many ways of stating the second law of thermodynamics. Perhaps the most common way is if you have a closed isolated system, its entropy always increases or remains constant. So we can ask, under what conditions can some state of a conventional thermodynamic system, like an ideal gas, evolve into some other state spontaneously. For instance, can the state of a bunch of particles clumped up together in the corner of a box, the gas particles clumped together in a, the corner of a box, end up uh, in a state or evolve to a state in which the particles are all spread out across the box? A thermodynamic process can happen spontaneously, just if the entropy increases monotonically over the course of the possible transformation. Again, the ordinary second law of thermodynamics concerns many, many particles and initial and final states that are equilibrium states, very quiescent states. We can extend those, the second law to small systems, to systems far from equilibrium. For instance, imagine pulling the DNA strand very quickly so it pops out of equilibrium. We can extend to quantum systems, information processing systems. We can get more detailed information from fluctuation theorems, as well as some from some results in resource theories. And these uh, extra kind of refined versions of the second law of thermodynamics are sometimes called second laws. That's about all the time that I have for talking about these subfields. But again, if you want more details, feel free to check out the various chapters in my book. There are lots and lots of opportunities, lots of subfields, lots of ways for you to get involved. Quantum thermodynamics is booming. There's lots of opportunity for um, new research in many directions. In summary, we said that we can use quantum information theory as a mathematical and conceptual toolkit for reimagining the thermodynamics of the 1800s for today's science. We saw that both information and work can serve as resources in both computation and thermodynamics. We saw that there are lots of subfields of quantum thermodynamics, a lot is happening, so it would be wonderful if you wanted to get involved. In case you're hooked, I can recommend a few references. These two papers are review papers. They describe the latest wave of quantum thermodynamics that began a little over a decade ago and makes very heavy use of quantum information theory. This book I published last year, it has background information about the different, sub, the different fields we need to understand in order to approach quantum thermodynamics, so information theory, quantum computation, thermodynamics, and introduces quantum thermodynamics, its history, many different subfields, major results, how to think about it and where it's going. Again, we can use quantum information theory to update the thermodynamics of the Victorian era for the 21st century. This blend of old and new gives us quantum steampunk. Again, steampunk fans dream it. Quantum information thermodynamicists live it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, I loved your talk and it was definitely a reminder of a little bit of thermodynamics. Um, usually when you 
uh, transition to the world of quantum, you forget a little bit about third of the more dynamics if you're not into this exact part of the field. So it's good to have these uh, like mixes of uh, fields that are not necessarily so obvious to combine and you combine them in a beautiful way. Um, Thank you. Plus, you had some beautiful uh, also like designs and uh, pictures in your slides. So I'd love to see that too. I'm glad you like the aesthetics. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess you're a, a fan of uh, steampunk. So I, it's interesting. I didn't realize that steampunk really existed as a movement until I think grad school. And since I realized that quantum thermodynamics is essentially steampunk and started developing this idea of quantum steampunk, I have increasingly realized that there were steampunk influences on me when I was young, but I wasn't aware of them. For instance, I read certain books like The Chronicles of Crestomancy by Diana Wynne-Jones and the His Dark Materials series by Philip Pullman that are steampunk. I just didn't realize what they were. I simply enjoyed them. It was sometimes sometime in grad school when I realized what steampunk was and then realized that what I did was the real world version of steampunk. And since then, I've, I've increasingly gotten into the aesthetic. I, I don't own any of the costumes that I showed on the first slide, but uh, shortly after I moved to Maryland, one of the communications teams, the communications team at the University of Maryland Institute for Advanced Computer Studies asked if I would be willing to do a quantum steampunk photo shoot. So they actually, the communications team bought a steampunk top hat for me to use in the photo shoot, and then they gave it to me afterward. So I can now say that I have a, a part of a steampunk costume, and I've been receiving gifts of little steampunk pieces of artwork. So it's increasingly, the, the aesthetic is increasingly moving from my slides into my home and office. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear. And hopefully next time you'll show us a picture of maybe if you're happy, you could post it on the Discord later for people to see as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, there are a bunch of pictures in a blog post that I wrote for Quantum Frontiers about the photo shoot. So if you just Google something like Nicole Younger Halpern, um, quantum steampunk photo shoot, then they should come up. Yep, good, great idea. Google usually answers their questions very fast. Um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the feedback you got for your book. You mentioned you got some interesting feedback. So uh, what was this special kind of feedback that you got? I've been really grateful that people from many different walks of life and different parts of the world have expressed interest in the book. There are some people who are science students or physicists, some people who are more into literature and art and don't think of themselves as science people, although um, I think the style of writing is uh, more understandable to people who are, say, um, have, have some physics background. Um, the, the most interesting piece of feedback and most unexpected that I received came in an email that I received last winter break. The beginning of the email started with basically an argument that the writer was not a crackpot. He started by saying, I, I'm on the board of the American Institute of Physics Foundation, and I have this Wikipedia page. So that is to say, I swear I'm not a crackpot. And then after that, the writer said, I, I found a typo in your book in the description about entropy. I really like the description of entropy, so well done. I, but I just wanted to let you know that there's this typo there. So I, I looked at the writer who was swearing that he was not a crackpot, and it turned out to be one of the founders of the internet. Wow. Um, <laughs> Very unexpected. So, like, yeah, it's definitely not a crackpot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's her name? Do you remember? This is Vint Cerf, Vint and Cerf. Okay. Well, wow. <laughs> well, very so interesting. If, if the founder of the internet uh, finds a typo in something that I've written and points it out, I guess I can't, yeah, it, it, especially if I'm writing about entropy, I guess I can't really object. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is where entropy leads you. Uh, now we have some questions from the chat. Everybody has been very active and 
uh, keep asking your questions. Remember that there's a giveaway. So my first question from the audience is from uh, Rodri Brut. Uh, they asked, do you see applications for environmental, environmental reduction in energy use for computing this way? We're currently, I think that the community has now started recently pivoting toward making quantum thermodynamics useful. Quantum thermodynamics has a long history of providing foundational insights, and it has provided great insights, say, about more detailed versions of the second law and the flow of time and so on. But it would be nice and appropriate if quantum thermodynamics were useful. I know of three um, potentially useful applications of quantum thermodynamics. One is um, an a quantum refrigerator that I worked on with collaborators. It was realized experimentally at Chalmers University in Sweden last fall. We're um, finishing up a paper about how this quantum refrigerator can actually benefit quantum computation. Suppose you have a superconducting qubit quantum computer. It's inside of a dilution refrigerator, so that is cold. Suppose you've just finished a computation. Your qubits are have quantum information stored in them, so they're entropic, they're noisy. You want to cool them down even more. You can hand them off to our quantum refrigerator, which consists of a couple of other superconducting qubits that are sitting inside the dilution refrigerator. This autonomous or this quantum refrigerator can cool the qubits down to a temperature that is lower than the lowest temperature in the dilution refrigerator. This um, one of the challenges of making quantum thermal machines useful is that merely to get the quantum thermal machines to behave quantum, we need to perform work and use a lot of control because we need to get these machines to low temperatures and so we have to cool them and cooling requires work. In the meantime, if we have a, a quantum engine, the quantum engine is not going to output much energy because it's so small. So it seems like we tend to lose out. Um, we put in more than we get out. But I think there are a few situations in which we can just naturally take advantage of quantum thermal machines. For instance, this quantum refrigerator of ours is inside the dilution refrigerator, which is already cold because people are using it to run their quantum computer. So we don't have to spend any significant extra work in order to cool our quantum refrigerator. Also, if you give this quantum refrigerator, uh, if you connect it to um, one of the outer layers of the dilution refrigerator, then um, this quantum refrigerator has access to a really, really cold environment in the middle of the dilution refrigerator and a warmer environment closer to the surface of the dilution refrigerator has a temperature gradient. If there is a temperature gradient, work can be extracted from it. So this quantum refrigerator is autonomous. It can just operate on its own without the need for explicit control so much. So I'm actively looking for more situations in which we can put a quantum thermal machine so that it can naturally take advantage of its surroundings and be useful and get around this problem of our needing to, in many situations, invest so much work in cooling and controlling quantum systems. Yeah, that takes up a lot of, a lot of work. And uh, if you can find a way around that, that's very interesting. Um, we have another question by Alex Can Q. Uh, they ask, uh, how would you compare Maxwell's daemon to something in quantum information? Is it an operator or an algorithm? So Maxwell's daemon, I guess I'll have only a few minutes to talk about he a few minutes to talk about it here, but Maxwell's demon is the subject of a, a lot of the a lot of chapter five, I think, in the book. So um, more thoughts are there. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Maxwell's demon, Maxwell's demon is a thought experiment that was proposed by James Clark Maxwell during the 1800s. So James Clark Maxwell, you might know better from Maxwell's equations with which govern electrodynamics. 
but Maxwell also contributed st significantly to statistical mechanics, which again is very closely related to thermodynamics. And Maxwell was asking, uh, Maxwell was kind of protesting the second law of thermodynamics. Again, there are many formulations of the second law of thermodynamics. One is, if you have only one system at one temperature, you can't extract work from it. You need a temperature gradient. He protested by coming up with a thought experiment. He said, suppose that you have a classical Gamison box, our favorite system, and there's a partition in the middle, and there's a, what he called a finite being, later other people called it a demon, who can operate a trap door in this partition. This finite being can let particles through the trap door in one direction, just if the particles are quick while moving quickly, while allowing particles to flow in the opposite direction, only if they're moving slowly. The demon can then separate fast moving particles from slowly moving particles. These two sets of particles will suddenly be at two different temperatures, high temperature and low temperature. Then the demon can hook up an engine to extract work from the temperature difference. At the end, the gas will become uniform again and again return to its one uniform temperature state. And then the demon can do this again and again and again, extract work via Perpetua Mobile, while the gas never changes. This seems impossible because we shouldn't be able to extract infinite amounts of work from just one gas, especially if that gas is only at one temperature. The maxwell demon paradox was resolved by uh, Charlie Bennett, who built on the work of Seelard and Landauer that we saw. We can also define, or yes, imagine quantum Maxwell demons. And uh, Maxwell demon's story is a process. So it involves state preparation, evolution, uh, possibly measurement, and possibly more evolution. So rather than regarding uh, Maxwell Demon as an operator or, um, or some similar uh, single mathematical object, I would regard the demon as an agent. Information theory and thermodynamics are operational theory, so they're agent-based. When using either of these theories, we think about agents who want to perform tasks, such as extracting work, given certain resources, such as gases and boxes, we ask what is the optimal efficiency that, with which the agent can perform this, gap, this task given their resources. Okay, well, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, so this one is by Dentucky Kirby. Uh, they ask, thermodynamics is such a historic topic, very old, well established, etc. Do you think thermodynamics needs a modern facelift in schools? Should it be taught a little differently nowadays? I have heard complaints about how thermodynamics is presented in many classes. Thermodynamics is, by a number of people, even someone who taught me thermodynamics, seen as old, stuffy, and boring. I think it's fascinating. I loved how it was taught, but that's only me. I think that it's quite possible that we might be able to interest a lot more people in, in thermodynamics and its potential through, for instance, steampunk and quantum steampunk. Uh, it's so easy to recognize how fascinating quantum theory is, and steampunk is a, a fun aesthetic. So I, I really hope that we can use those two angles in quantum steampunk to interest people anew in thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is so important, especially for issues we're facing today, such as energy crises. The world has an energy crisis, um, actually has multiple energy crises. So it is really important to interest people in thermodynamics to get them to use it and study it. And I really hope that quantum thermodynamics and related work can help with that effort. Yeah, you definitely have motivated me and hopefully many other people in the audience to look back at what we once knew about thermodynamics if we studied it in school 
uh, maybe even I'm Google glad. it. If you didn't study it in school, at least Google it and get a sense of what it is. Learn it in a in an interactive and fun way, hopefully, because it's definitely very important to to learn about it today. So thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, it was great to have you here. Excellent talk, great aesthetics, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the Discord. Uh, everybody, make sure to keep asking your questions there for Nicole to answer them. And uh, thank you maybe for even people will take a look at your book as well. If you want to share a link to your book there, if it's available online, that would be awesome. Sure. Thanks Thank very much. Thank you, Nicole.